Hi, welcome to God's Stories today. My name's Chris Thompson. You guys coming? Welcome to God Stories today. I'm really thrilled to have Bishop Martin Snow in, um, I was going to say in the studio today, but he is in a sense. We're doing this interview via Zoom, um, as most things are um, at the moment during COVID. Um, but I just can't thank Bishop Martin Snow enough for his time. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing here because you're an evangelist. And I'm an evangelist, and I love that energy when two evangelists get together. So it's just fantastic to have your company. It really, really is. Real pleasure, Chris. No, great to be with you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Um, as I always say, please do check us out um, on social media, on Instagram, uh, Facebook and Twitter. Just look for God Stories today. And when it comes to the YouTube channel, please do subscribe. Um, in subscribing, you are supporting. Um, this channel is not about the digitally evangelist storytellers. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ and inviting people into relationship with him. So by subscribing, you are supporting the work of the channel. Bishop Martin Snow, as I said, great to have you here. We normally start um, with a snapshot of where the person is right now in their life, what they're doing, uh, what, their, what their role is, what their ministry is. Um, you've got quite a small task, quite a, quite a more small ministry, I'd imagine. <laughs> so if you just whiz through that pretty quickly, that'd be fantastic. In, in terms of my role, I'm, uh, I'm Bishop of Leicester in the Church of England. Um, I, I, so I, I cover, as I say, the county of Leicester and Leicestershire, about a million people. Uh, we have about, well, getting on for sort of 400 churches. Um, we've got quite an ambitious program of, of planting new churches all across the, uh, the area, which is, uh, which is going really well, really exciting. And um, my day job, I suppose, really is kind of supporting all of that. So essentially a bishop, you know, kind of is there to encourage and support local churches in different communities all around the place. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to have a chance actually to reflect on all of that. Sometimes it's good, isn't it, to just stop and pause and say, you know, what's God doing at the moment? And uh, this conversation hopefully is a good chance to do that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. May it be so, may it be so. But into the mix as well, um, I don't know what a title is. Are you the Bishop of, the head of, I guess all is correct in some sense, um, but the Archbishop's College of Evangelists. Now, for, for those who aren't part of the Church of England, um, oh, well, actually, perhaps, Bishop, you might be able to explain what that is. Yeah, so this, uh, about 20 odd years ago, actually, the then Archbishop of Canterbury uh, wanted to encourage evangelists in the Church of England. So there are a number of sort of quite high profile evangelists, uh, people like J. John and uh, others who worked across the whole nation. And um, he wants to make sure that they were really linked into the Church of England, both, you know, for their own personal support, but also for the church, that actually they could be encouraging the church in, uh, in his witness and so on. So anyway, they set up this thing called the Archbishop's College of Evangelists and um, essentially evangelists who work on a sort of wider scale. So not, not just those who are involved in their own local community, but those who sort of work across a diocese or, or indeed region or nation, um, whatever it may be, um, are recognised then as, uh, as Archbishop's Evangelists. Uh, and then we have this college which just gathers people uh, usually about sort of two three times a year uh, we have different events to encourage people to inspire them and we're trying to work on a program now of how those evangelists can then help mentor and uh, encourage others so there's kind of like a new generation uh, coming through as well so yeah I get to uh, uh, to be a part of that which is a real privilege get to hear some fantastic stories meet some great people and um, yeah enjoy it yeah I've been doing it for the last, last couple of years or so now and they're uh, really enjoying it. Okay, so your God story, I'm really looking forward to getting into this. Um, we start, as I said, where you are now, but then we go right back to the beginning. And remember, this is your God story, okay? So we literally want to know, where were you born? So, uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, life for me began in, uh, in Indonesia, in uh, Southeast Asia, um, which is where my parents were working at the time. But th there's a strange sense in which the story, I suppose, even goes back before that, really, because... I'm a, I'm a third generation uh, missionary uh, family, basically. So my grandparents were missionaries in China. 
and then my parents were missionaries in uh, in Indonesia, and then in fact uh, my wife and I have worked in uh, in Africa as well. So, um, uh, but there's a sense that means for me the story starts even before I was born because I think there were people praying for me uh, even before I was born. Whether you know my parents, my uh, extended family, uh, and those who were part of the sort of mission organisation that my parents were a part of, uh, all praying for me. And, and I, I do think that that's somehow deeply significant. So, you know, my early days growing up uh, were filled with stories, again, of what God was doing in, in different parts of the world. We would have people coming to visit us from, you know, all different parts of the world, and they would stay. Uh, so every mealtime, uh, it was kind of like, you know, the food that I was eating, the, the air I was breathing was all about stories of what God was doing in, uh, in different parts of the world. So, um, yeah, really interesting interesting you know context in which to grow up and I guess not surprising in a sense that I then wanted to go and see some of those places and uh, even from an early age that actually my my faith was very very real and very important to me. Sounds like you were a spiritually marked man even before you were born <laughs> really does. So. and it's interesting yeah. um, Bishop M uh, Martin has very kindly sent you through some faith mile mark moments and there's a number of it would seem moments here where a neighbor has really, really influenced him, being really, really powerful. But there's also a story here of um, an aunt who um, I got the impression was unbeknown to him, praying for him. And, and that sort of therefore seems to be quite a constant thing, even before he was born. And maybe we can get into that in a moment. But before we do, you talk about these stories. And obviously this is God's stories today. And I am super fascinate, fascinated, as you might imagine, having been called to use the power of story for evangelism, which is what the conference is always going to be about. Can you remember any of the stories? I know that's a big ask because you, you know, you're like, you know, zero. <laughs> yeah, can, can you remember any of the stories? I mean, even if they were like retold to you later on? Mm. Well, yeah, it's, um, I mean, so, some of them, um, you know, as I say, different parts of the world. So churches in very different contexts and very different sorts of work that people were involved in. But my, um, so my grandfather was one of the first, uh, the first Western missionaries to go into what's called Yunnan province in, uh, in, uh, in China. Um, and uh, his, his work has since been written up as sort of biographies and so on of, of, of him that have been written. Um, and he became quite well known. So often when people would come and stay with us, uh, they would want to talk about him because, you know, they knew that, you know, my mother was his daughter and uh, uh, that she'd grown up in China with him and, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, so there was a lot of, lot of talk about that and the, and, um, uh, and the church in China in particular. Um, I mean, I mean, that in itself is a fascinating story. And, and uh, I guess kind of the story that I grew up in of, you know, he, he went to, to this part of China where um, there'd been no, no Christian missionaries before, uh, as far as we're aware, none, none at all. He lived there for many years, learned the local language, you know, adopted local customs and so on. And, um, you know, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ very faithfully mm -hmm. for years and years, uh, but with no response. So for years and years, he carried on doing this. Uh, with you know seemingly no response from any of the the local people at all, and one of the stories that I do I do remember that um, was told to me later on in life, and this has been really important to me actually in, in my own journey as well, was of an occasion where, um, as I say, he'd been doing this for many years with no response, and he he went out on a mountainside uh, to pray, um, and he was kind of you know pouring his heart out to God, saying you know. What am I doing here? Uh, did, did I did I get all this wrong? Did I mishear you? Um, should I not be here at all? Or you know what what is going on? And and he was really in the depths of despair. And in fact, he he later wrote to his mother. Uh, I mean, perhaps a strange thing to do in some senses, but he wrote to his mother uh, some while afterwards to say that he contemplated suicide uh, at that point, just thinking that he he'd got it all wrong and was ready to sort of throw himself off this mountain. Anyway, uh, anyway, he, did, he didn't, uh, thankfully, and he, he went back to his work. But it was, it was very interesting that he, he later wrote that um, from that moment, it felt actually as if there was a, a, a renewed spiritual energy, if you like, in, in the work that he was doing. And, uh, and it was just a little while later that uh, one of the people he'd been working with came to him and expressed some interest and said, I, I'd like to hear more about this, this God that you've been talking about. Um, and they started, uh, you know, to read the Bible together and so on. Um, cut a long story short, yeah, the person later, you know, gave their life to Christ, their family likewise, uh, and then other families started to follow as well. And uh, in the years that followed, a, a church grew up there. 
which which is now i mean a church that numbers in the millions you know it's it's a huge huge church now in uh, in china and it's um yeah it numbers in the millions but it so so there's something kind of special for me to think that it kind of went back to that moment when my grandfather actually was ready to give up he was on that point of giving up um but for whatever reason he didn't he went back to it and persevered and uh, the result now generations later is uh, is a thriving church well, so uh, yeah as i say that's been important to me over the years not half my word what a lineage i mean it also speaks i guess into the notion of um what is evangelism in terms of what it's like on the ground when you're trying to share the good news of Jesus Christ? It's the best news that there's ever been, basically, you know, and you're put into a very tough situation and then, you know, you start to sort of think crumbs. Is this actually going the way that perhaps I thought it might? Am I on the right track? Did I actually hear God right? And then you hear stories like this and you're just going to think, actually, wow, you know, in those desert times, God is there amongst you and beside you and before you just as much as when everything's successful, as it were. And I also think of like, if I may, I'm not so much of a theologian, but when I think about St. Paul and, you know, every single church he planted, I mean, you know, I, I had a friend of mine who actually went out and did that in the St. footsteps of St. Paul. And yeah. he said, none of the churches seem to be there anymore, you know? Uh, but, you know, would you ever class what he did as a failure? Well, no, you know? So it's interesting in terms of what God will do with, with what, you know, he's inspired you to do at, 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 at I guess, the time that he wants it to be. You know, because now it's a church, as you say, with like scores of people there. Uh, whereas at the time, you know, your family member, what you say is your grandfather or something, he was like willing to, well, just about to throw himself off the side of a mountain. It's, it's so inspiring and human and divine at the same time. Yeah, it, it is, isn't it? And, and I think, um, you know, you think back over the years since then, I mean, I mean all that's happened in China in particular. Uh, I mean, the church has experienced huge persecution um, and, uh, yeah, challenges in, in all sorts of ways. So, uh, you know, there, there's something about actually how God works behind the scenes sometimes in all these things as well. And, um, you know, and, and our part just being one small part in all of that, I suppose, when you think of the sweep of history. Yeah, each one of us is just playing a tiny little part in that. But what, what an amazing privilege to be called by God to do that sort of thing mm. and play our part in, in history in, in that way. Um, I, I think, you know, there's no greater privilege, as you say, in, in life than uh, called to do that. But we don't always see it at the time. You know, at the time, it can feel like a hard slog. Mm -hmm. It can feel like, um, you know, really tough going. Uh, but sometimes we have to sort of zoom the camera right out, don't we, to see that bigger picture of the sweep of history, uh, which is in a sense what the Bible does, of course. That's what the Bible does, isn't it? It takes these individual stories and places them in the context of the great, great sweep of history. And we start to realise, actually, Actually, that um, yeah, our, our actions count, and you know, just that little act of obedience to God uh, can make a difference in the whole whole of history. Gosh, it's so inspiring. And if if I may be so bold to sort of say, I, I offer it humbly, even though I described it as bold. The vision that God gave us for God's stories today is to record stories just like those. Um, within the the vision imparted by God, it was about recording the stories of what the world might call ordinary people who are called by God to do extraordinary things, not through their own ability, but through God. And mainly because of one thing, they said yes. And then God was able to use that yes and do astonishing things. So, so hearing a story like that is just wonderful in terms of uh, GST and all that it's called to be. Now, in terms of journeys like that, though, the very next thing on your faith mile marker list that you kindly sent through to me um, is about the support a person might receive along the way of such a journey and just generally in life as well because you say a family friend or in brackets or aunt which is interesting it says a lot who prayed for me every day and that's all you put and in my head i'm thinking crumbs you know was this one of the ones now you said it was she would look like before birth and now like during life as it were and i wrote down here when did you find out that your aunt i'm gonna call your aunt had been praying for you and was praying for you every day and did it kind of coincide with some sort of pivotal holy spirit filled moment as well so yeah, I mean, I, I didn't find out until uh, until after she died, and and I think you know that kind of says something in itself about um, you know her humility and, uh, and her perseverance and so on. But but there's an interesting story behind it. Yeah, so um, she too, she was a missionary in China as well. So she got to know my my grandparents uh, while they were in China, and um, they were there during the the Second World War. So when when Japan invaded China, wow, and and it just so happens that uh, um, 
that my mother and her sisters were, were at a boarding school in China uh, when the Japanese invent, uh, invaded. And um, uh, this particular friend of the family was with them in that boarding school. So they went into, they were taken into internment. All the Westerners basically were, were rounded up and uh, put in an internment camp, as, as it was called. So my mother, with her two sisters and her mother and this family friend, all ended up in the internment camp together, wow. while my mother's father was still back home uh, in Yunnan province um, uh, in the mission field. Um, anyway, so, so they went through the war years, basically, in, in this internment camp together. Uh, my mother didn't never really talked about it very much. It, it, it was clearly not a pleasant experience at all, mm -hmm. and it was only very late on in her life that my mother ever ever sort of talked about it. Um, uh, and in fact, it, interestingly, it came up. Sorry, it's a slight aside from the story, but anyway, it came up through the fact that the uh, uh, the film Chariots of Fire, oh. um, Eric Liddell, the uh, the Scottish uh, uh, Olympic medalist, uh, he was also in that same internment camp. Uh, so you may remember after, after he won his uh, gold, his um, yeah, Olympic gold medal, he, he too actually went out to be a missionary in China and uh, he was uh, there at the time when the Japanese uh, uh, invaded as well. So anyway, long story. Uh, I'm very, yeah, my aunt, therefore, was a very close friend of the family and supported them through those, uh, those, those war years. Stayed in touch with the family and um, uh, then as I was growing up, um, she would come and visit us regularly. So, you know, I was growing up in the UK at this time. Um, she would come and stay with us because of the, the very close uh, friendship and so on. And hence the fact she was known to us as an aunt, even though you know she wasn't uh, uh, directly related. Uh, she she was an interesting character though because, um, and I say this slightly to my shame, um, my sister and brother and I, um, we, we would always uh, uh, laugh rather a lot when, whenever she came to stay. She was one of these people who could just talk endlessly. So almost from, from the moment she got up in the morning to, to the moment she, she slept at night, she did not stop talking. Endless flow of, of stories and uh, words and so on. And uh, I'm afraid the three of us as young children used to be in hysterics sometimes at the way she, uh, she just didn't shut up at all. Anyway, um, yeah, it wasn't until she then died um, that my mother, in talking to me about her, said... Um, well, you do know that she prayed for you every day of your life uh, from before you were born uh, to, to the day she died. She, she prayed for you every day. And I, I just remember, I suppose, at the time, not, not really knowing what to say to that. It's kind of, you know, what, what do you say to that? But just being extraordinarily humbled, I suppose, in thinking, wow. So she, uh, yeah, she cared for me so much that she prayed for me every single day. Again, not knowing necessarily. I mean, I was still, you know, very young at that stage when, when she died. So she has no idea what, what I've gone on to do in my life and so on. But um, nevertheless, she, she prayed faithfully in that way. And, uh, and I'm convinced now I, I certainly would not be here today had it not been for her prayers. Uh, I'm sure in all sorts of ways that, that has shaped me in terms of who I am. So, yeah, importance of prayer. I mean, I'm, perhaps... I mean, you've already covered it in one sense, talking about the power of prayer and so forth. But I don't know if I'm so in the zone of prayer now. I'm so sort of like inspired to pray. I'm just wondering if you might now, now that you are where you are and looking back on your entire story, just maybe just share a few thoughts about the power of prayer and how you've seen it move, you know, th throughout your time as an evangelist and a bishop and a minister and in your early life as well. And pick any story in any season of your life. I'm just in the zone of prayer now. Um, if you can go out your inspirational aunt. And I bet she does know, if you don't mind me saying, that might be theologically <laughs> correct, but I want to say I bet she does know. <laughs> indeed, indeed. No, I'm sure that's that's right. Um, oh, there's so, I mean, so many different stories I, I could choose, I suppose. But I, I guess... Um, I, I suppose partly because of my background again as well, I, I sometimes think about what's sometimes called the different languages of prayer. Um, so, you know, sometimes we, we can we can think that, you know, there's only one way to talk to God and, you know, uh, everyone's got to learn this particular way of doing it or whatever. I, I, I just don't believe that at all. I, I think through my life, I've, I've discovered, I've learned different languages of prayer. And, and it's, yeah, it is. It's a bit like learning any language, I suppose. Really, you start out very with very faltering language, and you you make all sorts of mistakes, and you you say all sorts of stuff that um, you know. If you hear yourself back saying it, you think that's just stupid. You know, <laughs> why on earth did you say that? But isn't it just amazing? Just that sense of actually, when you're with a close friend, 
uh, or when you're with your fa family member, it doesn't matter what you say, really. It's, it's about an expression of a relationship, an expression of love, an expression of just enjoying being together. Uh, and that, for me, is, is the heart of prayer. So, you know, I, I, I have moments when, uh, you know, as with any friend, I just talk about whatever's on my mind, whatever it might happen to be. Uh, I have moments when I'm lost for words, when actually I just don't know what to say. And I go back to that idea of, of God being able to read the, uh, you know, the sighs and the inner, inner thoughts uh, within me. Um, I have moments when I love using other people's prayers. You know, the idea that some people have written down prayers that they've uh, uh, thought about really carefully and, and are like poetry. Um, I love that. So, so, you know, different languages of prayer, I, th I think, are really important. But the heart of it is for every one of us just to be able to enjoy that relationship. And, and I think, yeah, that's what I come back to again and again. Um, don't worry about what you say, basically. It's just about being with God and enjoying the fact that God enjoys being with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. May that bless everyone who watches this uh, interview. What I love there is the humanness, if you like, of your story. It's very, very human. And, and it, it kind of warmed me to you very much so because it's, it's just full of like, you know, um, just amazing God moments, but also within all of that, your humanness comes through because we've had here, you know, three generations of um, missionaries and so forth, uh, people praying and, and, and so forth, and this amazing aunt. And, and, but then I love the fact you say here in your very next faith mile marker, teenage rebellion. <laughs> Church is not interesting or relevant and uh, to none of my age. <laughs> I love that. Could you talk about that? Talk about that sort of what was going on, you know, what was going on there? Uh, I, I mean, I have to be honest, I, suppose, I mean, it, you know, it wasn't a full-blown rebellion necessarily um, in the way that some teenagers do, I guess. But nevertheless, yeah, certainly in terms of church, I, I absolutely hit that time in my, my teenage years when um, I, yeah, I just could not see the relevance of it. Um, services were boring. Uh, there were very few other people my age in the, in the church that we, uh, as a family, were part of at that time. So I did. I turned off from it, and um, you know, I had quite a few rows with my parents about why, you know, why should I go to church and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, interestingly, I mean, I mean, what what changed it all then? So at the age of sixteen, I um, I left home and, and moved to a new city. We were living up in the, in the northeast at this time in Northumberland. Uh, I went to live in Newcastle and um, uh, we, I went to stay with a family friend um, while I, I went to school to sixth form. Um, so, I, you know, I kind of landed in, the, in this city where I didn't know anybody, mm -hmm. uh, about to start at a, you know, a brand new school. Um, again, I didn't know anybody. It was in one sense all a big adventure, but in another sense all quite scary uh, as a 16 year old. So, uh, I mean, the story that I often tell, um, Basically, the guy who happened to live next door to us, as it turned out, um, the day before I was due to start school, he came and knocked on the door of, of the house where I was staying. And he simply introduced himself and he said, I, I gather you're going to be coming to my school uh, starting tomorrow. Um, how about we walk to school together? Oh, right. And it was just, you know, such a tiny thing in one sense, but just a lovely act of kindness that he'd actually stopped to think about what it was going to feel like for me being completely new there, um, and, and he wanted to help in some way. So we did. We walked to school. He introduced me to people, showed me around, you know, all the stuff that a, you know, a good friend does. And it was then, several weeks later, after he'd done this, when he then said to me, oh, by the way, um, so a few of us meet together after school, and we, we read the Bible together. Um, would you like to come and join us? Uh, and so, of course, you know, because he'd shown himself to be such a good friend, of course, I said, yeah, and I went along. And it was, you know, for me, it was just absolutely revolutionary, really, in the sense of it was the first time I'd met a bunch of people my own age mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who didn't just talk about God, but I could see that it made a real difference in their lives in terms mm -hmm. of what, what they did and, uh, uh, as I say, the sort of simple acts of kindness. So that's kind of really where, where my faith, uh, I guess, took off, you might say. I, I, you know, long been there, I suppose. I'd long had a faith. But this was the moment when I actually started to see what a difference it can make in life. And uh, as I say, being a part of uh, a bunch of people who were so 
so keen to explore what, what walking with Jesus in life really looked like. Uh, it made all the difference to me. So, yeah, I kind of look back to that as a hugely significant milestone for me. That's wonderful. And what an inspiring example it is about sharing the love of Jesus Christ. It just started with one guy knocking on your door and saying, fancy walking to school together. You know, it wasn't like a big, massive, wide city sort of project. It wasn't, you know, anything with pyrotechnics or fireworks or, you know, digital this or digital that, all the stuff that I like. But it was like, it was just someone saying, do you want to walk to school together? And from that, wow, look what happened. What I find interesting, though, is that it would seem that your faith was obviously there before that particular pivotal moment. Um, but the inspiring stories, the inspiring people around you, you, you hadn't thought about perhaps becoming a minister or even a missionary, it would seem from what you've just said then, at any point up until, well, at, up until zero to 16. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's fair to say. I, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess because of that sort of mini rebellion, if you like, during my teenage years, I, yeah, I never saw myself, you know, working in the church or, or being a missionary or anything like that at all. Um, in fact, during that, that stage, I, I developed a fascination with, uh, uh, with planes, with aeroplanes. Uh, and saw myself, you know, going to become a, a fast jet pilot in the RAF and, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't quite have the eyesight for it. So, uh, that, was, that was never going to happen. But anyway, um, so, yeah, I think I... I that, that, that experience when I was 16 kind of confused me a little bit. So I, 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 as I say, I developed these other interests and was thinking I was sort of heading in one particular direction. And then it kind of threw up some questions for me about, well, yeah, where am I now heading? Mm. And I, I did that classic thing, I suppose, where I, I, you know, I went to university, not because I, I necessarily knew what I wanted to study at university or knew where it was all going, but just because it was kind of expected of me to go to university. So I thought I'd better do it. Um, I, I spent three years then, you know, so for what it's worth, I, I studied chemistry at university with apologies to any chemists who may be, uh, may be watching this, but uh, <laughs> three, three years was enough to maybe decide I didn't want to do chemistry. And so, uh, so I went off and got a job anyway, again, at the end of university, just, just because I needed a job. <laughs> but it was at that point, I suppose, where I really, you know, through university and then into that first job, where I started to get more and more involved in the church. And and I guess particularly in sort of leadership roles. So I I, I found myself, um, you know, leading different groups in university uh, and then church groups afterwards. Um, And that's when I sort of really started to think, oh, actually, maybe God is calling me to do something uh, uh, in the church in some way. But um, but it was a long journey. Yeah, there was certainly no, you know, there were no uh, flashes of lightning or thunderbolts or anything. It was just a, a, a sort of gradual exploration of where where God might want me where God was calling me. And according to your notes here, it says around that sort of time that Christian summer camps also played a big role, yeah. um, you know, and I can understand they certainly did with me, but also just to let the viewers know, you mentioned the university, um, it would have seen from your notes as well that you got involved with the Christian union mm. and it said it led a group of several hundred. Mm. Did, am I reading that right? Several hundred. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. With the university. I mean, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, University Christian Union was was quite big. Yeah, there were there was there were several hundred people, I think, in uh, in the um, the Christian Union. Um, and uh, as you know, I mean, they sort of rotate the leadership, so different people lead uh, each each year. So that that was sort of part of what I was saying, I suppose, about being thrown into positions of leadership fairly early on. Um, where I mean, to be honest, looking back now, I hadn't a clue what I was doing, but uh, you kind of just muddle along and uh, do do what you think you can. Um, but there's something, I guess the theme through all of that is there is something really significant about, um, about being with groups your own age. I, I do think for, for teenagers and young adults and so on, uh, there is that need to be, to be with people your own age where people who are asking similar questions, exploring a similar journey with you, uh, all that sort of thing. So, so the Christian summer camps, yeah, was significant in that way. I, I'd attended some as a child, so... Mm-hmm. Um, during my years growing up, my parents had uh, uh, sent me off to these different camps. I mean, they were great fun. It was all, you know, sort of outdoor camping, uh, uh, just different outdoor activities. I, I loved it. But um, then as a um, uh, sort of older teenager, young adult, I, um, uh, I started going to help lead some of those camps and, and would, would be involved in running them. Um, and again, you know, I mean, there's nothing better in some senses to help you grow your faith than to have uh, children or young people asking you questions. Oh yes, <laughs> that, that thing of yeah, all, all the tough questions that uh, uh, that everybody has, 
but the children have a way of articulating, um, which really make you stop and think. Um, so I, I would say that was really formative for me, actually having to think through some of those questions uh, and having people who wouldn't wouldn't let me get away with the uh, you know the sort of easy answers or anything like that, but uh, really make you think. And before we go on to the next season, um, casting your mind back, you may or may not be able to recall, but were there any significant God moments at the Christian summer camps at um, the university, moments where God broke through, spoke to you, healed something, uh, revealed something to you or someone else, any sort of God moments along the way that you might be willing to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I do remember as a child, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm one of those people actually who has very few memories of my childhood. I, I know some people can remember everything vividly, but I, I'm just one of those people who, uh, you know, I've got one or two pictures in my mind from my childhood, but, but nothing much more than that. But interestingly, one of the pictures actually is, is from um, a summer camp that I went to. Mm -hmm. And it was in Wales, I remember, and it was uh, it was a camp. We were all you know under canvas, so to speak. And um, I remember it because, uh, and it was classic. I mean, it, it it almost sounds a bit cliche to say this, but uh, but it, it's true. So I'm going to say it. Um, you know, we had an evening meeting. Somebody had been talking about about God. I, I don't even remember what they'd been saying particularly now, but I just remember coming out from the tent where we'd had this meeting, and walking back across the fields. Uh, and looking up and it was one of those you know beautiful clear night skies we were in the middle of nowhere so just stars everywhere and I remember being blown away from it you know just just uh, stopping sort of in the middle of the fields just being overawed by by this scene and whatever the speaker had been saying it made me at that moment sort of say you know God if you're there and if you created all of this um then I want to know you. Uh, and it was just as simple as that, really. Um, and uh, again, yeah, I, I would say that was a significant milestone. I mean, I was only probably seven or eight or something at the, at the time. But uh, that sense of creation and the wonder of creation uh, making us think about God, I, I think is, is hugely significant. I mean, it sounds like that, that the, the being overwhelmed by God's creation and with that, the magnitude of God, that Celtic sort of side of things to that in and of itself is beautiful and enough. But I just wondered, just as a bit of a follow up question, may not have happened. I don't know. As I said, the actual experience in and of itself is just overwhelming enough. But did God, when you turned around to him and said, look, if you created all of this on that starry night, mm. I want to know you personally. Did anything happen at that particular point? Did he speak to you there and then? Did something happen the next day? Did something sort of like click? Did it all, oh, you know, that sort of thing? No, you know, Chris, no, I, I can't say honestly that it did. I, I think it's it sort of sticks in my mind as um, as a significant moment when I, I, as I say, I kind of felt overwhelmed and uh, kind of wanted to offer myself to God in some way. I, I suppose... Um, what I would link it to, though, is the kind of ongoing journey from then on. So, you know, when I was talking earlier about the friend who invited me to the Bible study after school, um, when I was sort of 16, 17, um, it was then, I suppose, when I then started to go into to reading the Bible in more detail and, you know, looking at the gospel stories about Jesus, uh, looking at the stories of the early church and so on, that I... I guess that was the moment when I started to connect these different things, mm. you know, and what had originally been just this overwhelming experience uh, of creation and so on, then starting to connect that onto, oh, so this same God who uh, made all this wonderful creation is also the God who sent his son into the world. Wow. Um, and is also the God whose son died on the cross uh, as an expression of love for me. Um, so I started to make all those sort of connections and put them together and to think, wow, OK, this, you know, this is not just a God who, you know, sometimes said, you know, who sort of created the world and wound it up and kind of then left it to, to go off and uh, on its own way. Um, this is the God who created the world and stayed involved in it, mm -hmm. um, even when things started to go wrong, you know, didn't give up on it. But, uh, but in, in a sense, you know, wanted to get even more involved in it. Um, and, and that, I suppose, again, has just been powerful for me, I suppose, that sense of, um, yeah, even when things go wrong and things, even when I wander off and do stuff in, in the wrong way or whatever, God doesn't give up on me. God keeps coming back. And uh, that sense of just how far God will go in his love for us to, uh, to draw us back to himself. Um, that's been really important for me. It is an astonishing thing to contemplate the magnitude of God 
when you contemplate his creation, which of course he himself is even bigger up then. Um, and then from that, to contemplate just how God is always pursuing us, as you say, always coming towards us, never going to give up on us, always reaching out to us. And, and it's just kind of like, you know, out of all the people in the world right now and also the people in history and to come, it's just kind of like, it's like he knows us as, as well as everyone else. It's like, even though we're not his favourite, we feel like his favourite. It's just the most astonishing thing. It is. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. What I love, though, is this. Um, your next one, and I'm, I want to know what happened here. You gave up a job in law courts. So I don't know what you were doing in the law courts. I'd love to know what the job was. <coughs> Excuse me. But you gave up the job in law courts to work voluntary uh, for local inner city church as an evangelist, door-to-door visiting, which I can't, I, I can't do the door-to-door thing. It's just not me. Um, in high-rise block flats. I mean, what was going on there? Obviously, we've heard this amazing story, the journey, the subtlety, the power, how God's changing your heart, um, especially when that gentleman asked, if he could walk you to school. And then from that, you had the Bible study and you saw people actually like their, their faith being lived out and meaning something to them. So all that's been going on, but what was specifically going on at that time for you to give up a job? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, I, well, I described how I, I sort of, you know, went to university and then left university without really much idea of what I wanted to do in life. Um, I had to go out and find a job and I ended up being a clerk in, a, in the law courts, basically. So that it was a very boring job, I'm afraid. Um, a very good job. I mean, I, I enjoyed it and um, it was a really good experience, seeing a whole insight into another, uh, another, another world, if you like. But anyway, I, I've been doing that a couple of years, uh, involved in, in the local church where we lived, uh, which was in inner, inner city uh, Sheffield. And uh, the vicar of that church at the time, I mean, bless him, he, a quite incredible guy. Um, you know, we were chatting one day and, uh, and he kind of said to me, so, you know, have you ever thought of, uh, of, of working in the church, ever thought of, uh, you know, ministry in, in the church? And I, I mean, my immediate reaction was sort of saying to him, no, actually, not really. Uh, you know, not really contemplated it very much at all. But, uh, you know, he, he, he wouldn't sort of let go and he kind of persisted and said, you know, I think, think you should. I think you should uh, explore this. And then he, he uh, surprised me completely by saying, um, in fact, I, I, I really think you should come and work for us. Come and work for our church and, uh, and, and be involved in some of the, the stuff that we're doing in the local community. Um, he said, you know, we, we could give you a job, you know, maybe just for a year to start with, see how it goes. Um, and it wasn't until sort of he sort of explained all the rest of it that he said, uh, oh, but by the way, we can't pay you. Uh, you'll, you'll have to do it voluntarily. <laughs> uh, I kind of had to give him full marks for, uh, for trying at least and, uh, with his boldness. Anyway, I went away and thinking about it from that. And, and I guess maybe because of his boldness, I, I thought about it quite seriously and talked to my wife about it. We'd, we'd not long been married. And... Um, yeah, I just had this really strange sense, actually. And I, I guess looking back at it now, it was God speaking to me of saying, actually, yeah, you should do this. This is, this is the start of a whole new adventure. Uh, and you've got to let go of some stuff. And you've just got to throw yourself into it. And, um, you know, we'll see where it takes you. And what did God so, do? There were any moments of knocking on people's doors when God did stuff? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So um, there was this, uh, an evangelist working in the church there, uh, a woman who'd been, uh, lived in the community a long time, did a lot of work in the local community. And so I spent most of my year sort of working alongside her. And she would literally go uh, knocking from door to door. This was sort of inner city Sheffield. We had some of these huge tower blocks. They were called streets in the sky. So they, they would they would go on for sort of half a mile or so. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever it was, eight, nine stories uh, tall. And we would, we'd sort of work along these corridors and we just, we just knock on these doors. And um, there's one, I mean, one instant, I have a story I often, often tell, which um, uh, even now I smile as I, as I think about it. Um, you know, knocked on a door, uh, no response to start with. And so we were just about to move on. Um, when I, I heard the letter flap sort of go, you know, the little letter flap in the, in the door and it's sort of, I heard it go. And this voice came out through the letter flap, uh, simply saying, uh, what do you want? Yeah. It was slightly more colourful language than that, but I won't, uh, I won't repeat that for, uh, for today. Um, anyway, so I, I then had sort of crouched down and uh, saw these eyes sort of the other side of the, uh, the letter flap and uh, did you know, what I always did, sort of explain we were from the local church, we were just coming to meet people in the community, uh, find out you know, what's going on in the local community and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, anyway, we, we ended up having sort of you know, a bit of a conversation through the, uh, through the letter flap. And, uh, and then I heard the, the lock sort of going on the inside of the door and he opened the door. 
And it was then that I realized why he hadn't opened the door initially, because even as he opened the door, the, um, the smell almost knocked me off my feet. And um, uh, without wanting to be too vivid about it, but um, basically it turned out, I think he kept, he kept nine cats uh, in, uh, in his flat, in his high rise flat, uh, didn't let them out at all. And um, uh, if that wasn't bad enough itself, when he then sort of invited us into the house, um, uh, it turned out the flat above him had had a water leak and there was water literally running down the side of, uh, of the wall of, uh, of his flat and the carpet was soaked and various furniture soaked and so on. Um, anyway, I mean, it was one of those moments when I say I'd not been doing this job very long and I kind of stood there thinking, OK, what do we do now? Um, but thankfully, this experience of anxious that I was working with, um, you know, immediately got on the phone to some people. Uh, we got, you know, got the council around to take care of the water leak, uh, got RSPC around to take care of the, uh, you know, the cats and, uh, uh, and then got the church involved in terms of finding some new furniture and, uh, and so on for him. Um, and it was a similar story, again, in the sense of, you know, this all then took place over several weeks as we sort of got him sorted out with new furniture, new carpets, all the rest of it. And then again, you know, the evangelist I was working with simply said to this guy, um, you know, we, we have a little group that meets every week uh, just to talk about God a bit. Would you like to come along? Come and join us. Um, and cut a long story short, you know, he did. He came, came and joined that little group and uh, eventually, you know, became a Christian and, uh, and joined the local church. And, and I have to look back at that, I suppose, again, it's quite, quite formational for me. I mean, both the thing of, you know, if we hadn't been there that day knocking on doors, you know, we never would have met him. We never would have known what, what situation he was in. Um, but then also, again, just that link around, uh, you know, the practical action, the practical care for somebody leading on to, um, well, actually, the reason we do this is because of God's love for us. Would you like to hear more about God's love uh, and, uh, and about Jesus Christ? Um, yeah, that, uh, at his heart, for me, that is what evangelism is about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's many other things as well, but at, at its simplest form, that is what it's about. It's so inspiring. And was it around this sort of time, therefore, that God perhaps started knocking on the door to your heart, re-ministry and ordination in particular? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I kind of... Yeah, I look back to almost that incident, actually, as, as kind of almost a turning point for me when I realised, almost if you like, the penny dropped, and I realised, actually, you know what, this is what God has called me to do. And, uh, and what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. So, um, you know, it's kind of a long story short. Yeah, I did. I started conversations about, you know, ministry in the Church of England and what that looks like. And it's a long process you have to go through. But, um, yeah, I, I look back to that instance as being really, really significant in that. And, and even today shapes my ministry. So, you know, for all that, I spend a lot of my time doing all sorts of other stuff now. Um, there are a few things I enjoy more than actually meeting people, whether that's in their own homes or out on the streets or, you know, wherever it is, and just being able to have simple conversations about God. Um, that's, you know, that's what energizes me. That's, uh, uh, that's my vision for ministry. Um, so, yeah, it's never gone away. In that way. Thank you for that. Um, I want to get to Africa, if I may. Um, so you said yeah. ministry in South Yorkshire, a uh, former coal mining area. That obviously was a significant sort of moment. And, and do feel free to mention any God stories um, along the way there. But you then go from Yorkshire to Africa uh, with CMS, uh, learning about uh, colonialism and cross-cultural mission. And it's really interesting, as we talk now, um, one of the interviews I've done previously, which was with uh, a lady called Nicola Neal, she's a regional coordinator for New Wine. Um, she talks extensively about her being calling, called by God to give up everything, to give up paid employment, her and her husband. And they were quite, you know, comfortable at the time and literally go to Africa and what she saw out there and what God did in her heart. <clears throat> and even in the moment when she said, there we were living in you know, like middle-class England, and they were like landed on a plane. I think it was in Uganda, if I remember right. And she said the moment she landed on the tarmac, she felt like it was home. I mean, you know, the, the, the moves of God in a person's heart when, when he does something like that, that kind of calling. If you're willing, perhaps you might talk about what was going on in your heart, what was going on in your relationship with God, and how he called you to, to move to Africa. And I know there's a lot of questions here in, in one. I'm just excited. <laughs> what was it like? What did God do? <laughs> so it's kind of kind of the long story for me, but again, for time, I won't, won't sort of give all the details. But essentially, it goes back to the beginning. As I said, you know, third generation missionary, 
grew up in a household hearing stories from all around the world about what God was doing. So I, I always knew at some stage that, that I wanted to go and experience something more of that for myself. So after training for ministry in the Church of England, uh, and I was, by the way, I was up very upfront with the Church of England through all that process and saying to them, you know, actually, if you train me, I will go off to another country and uh, work elsewhere. Uh, it won't just be in England. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I, I did, did all the training I had to do, as I say, including what's called a curacy, uh, which was in, uh, in South Yorkshire. And then, then went off to, to Africa. And my wife and I had, had just long had a love for, for Africa in particular. And I don't really know where that came from, but I, I guess just one or two visits where, um, yeah, we, we, we just so loved the, uh, the sense of hospitality, the vibrancy of, uh, of life that we saw there and so on. So, so really strong pull to, to go there. And a strong sense, if I'm honest, I suppose, starting out of, of you know, feeling that actually, yeah, we had something to offer, you know, that we would go there to be able to, you know, for me in terms of church ministry, uh, for my wife, who's a medic, you know, that she would offer her medical skills. Um, and as is so often the case, of course, we came back having realized that actually we, we received far more than, we, than ever we gave. Awesome. And that actually Africa shaped us rather than us uh, uh, doing anything there. But, uh, and I suppose just one little story from that, I suppose, which again has, has stuck with me in ministry because, um, you know, we, we worked in the sort of very rural part of uh, West Africa. There's lots of tiny villages and so on. A uh, very mix of, of, of sort of religious influences. So, so Islam was quite strong there, but so was the sort of African, you know, tribal religions and so on. So a strong mix of different things. But um, I, I had a very strange encounter at one time. And it, it only happened the once, but, um, but it, it, it happened where a woman came to see me. And um, she... Uh, she, she spoke to me and just simply said, a few nights ago, I had a dream. Mm -hmm. And she said, I saw, I saw this man stood in white, uh, stood at the bottom of my bed. And uh, something made me realize that this man was, was Isa or, or Jesus. Um, and she said, the man just simply said to me, uh, go and find the white man in the village and he will tell you all about me. Uh, and that was it. That was that was her dream. So lo and behold, a couple of days later, she knocks on my door uh, and tells me this dream and says, so, so tell me, tell me all about Isa, uh, which was just an extraordinary experience, as I say, to have that sort of completely out of the blue. And, um, you know, so I did. Obviously, I was able to tell her, tell her more about it. Interesting, I didn't see much of her again. So even to this day, actually, I don't really know, uh, you know, what, what's, what's happened to her. But I, you know, it's one of those things I can only say God intervened very dramatically in her life. It's not like that for a lot of people, but for her it was. It was a very clear sense of through a dream of God speaking to her. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's something I've held on to again, because I do think sometimes in, in the West, uh, and particularly in the Church of England, I say it, you know, we can be very, we want to be very intellectual. We want to have all the answers to everything. We want to have everything thought through. Um, and I hold on to things that sometimes God just cuts through all of that. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a dream or a vision or whatever, um, God sometimes chooses to speak very, very directly to people. Um, doesn't happen all that often, in my experience at least. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it does happen, uh, yeah, that can be life changing. Just, just if you don't mind dwelling on that a little bit further. Can you cast your mind back, if, if it's possible, to the moment when she knocked on your door and, and she told you that story? How did, how did you feel? I mean, what did it do for your faith? Mm. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, in one sense, it blew me away. I mean, I, I, I guess I'd heard stories about that sort of thing before. So I, I, as I say, you know, talking with other missionaries and so on, people had said that sort of thing to me before, but I, I'd never encountered it. So it, it was absolutely a first for me. And... Um, yeah, there was just that extraordinary feeling of um, of, of realising that, that God was actually, yeah, there was a sense God was using me. Mm -hmm. That actually, you know, this woman who had never met me before had been told by God in a dream to come and find me. And, uh, you know, that, again, was just extraordinarily humbling to think, um, you know, my little act of obedience in going, going there to, to, to be there in Africa and to live in that place meant that God could use me in that way to, uh, to speak to somebody. Um, and I guess, you know, kind of go back to where we started in this conversation. It's that thing, isn't it, of when we say yes to God and when we're obedient, 
we just have no idea of how God is going to use that and uh, how that's going to, going to touch other people's lives. Um, and that's both extraordinarily humbling uh, as well as extraordinarily exciting. Mm. And uh, what an amazing adventure to, uh, uh, to know that uh, God is using us in that way. Uh, so inspiring. It really, really is. And again, your next faith mile marker moment, you say um, you had a ministry in the inner city Sheffield, learning about intercultural community and fresh expressions of church. Mm. Just for a few moments, if they just talk about that, what was God doing? But in particular, the fresh expression side of thing. I've got a pioneering evangelistic heart. Um, I love the established churches as well. And, and one of the talks I'm going to be giving soon in a, in a where I've been invited to give a talk is about how perhaps sacramental worship might be used a little bit more in fresh expressions and stuff. If you could talk just a little bit about fresh expressions and maybe what you've seen God doing, then that would be brilliant. Yeah, so, I mean, this is coming back from Africa, and I, I got a job as a vicar in, uh, in Sheffield again. Um, and a realisation, I guess, you know, within the community where I was living, you know, th there were huge numbers of people who, who were never going to come to church. Mm. You know, it didn't matter what, you know, how, how exciting we made the worship. It didn't matter, you know, what, what sort of jazzy activities we did uh, in the church building. They were not going to come. Um, you know, these people are just miles away from church. So I think, you know, early on in my year, so we did quite a bit of thinking together as a church. So, so what do we need to do? You know, if, if we are going to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people who live in this community, um, we can't just sit here and wait for them to come to us because it's not going to happen. <laughs> So, so how do we go out and, and find them? And, and some of that is about, you know, what I was talking about earlier, going out and knocking on doors maybe, or, um, you know, going, uh, hanging out around shops or whatever, just getting into conversation with people. And that sort of stuff is, is really good. But I think there was a realisation, this was around the time that the Church of England and other churches generally were talking about fresh expressions of church. And, and it's, it kind of works on the principle of, you know, where do people naturally gather? You know, so if people aren't going to come to church, where is it that they do gather anyway? Um, and we realized that as we looked around the community where we lived, you know, there were a number of pubs, you know, where lots of people would go to gather. Um, it was the sort of area where lots of people would hang out around the shopping area. Uh, and, and just, you know, especially when the weather was nice, they'd stand, stand around outside and, uh, and chat together, all these sorts of things. So we started to get together some ideas and basically say, look, uh, given this is where people gather anyway, we need to go to them. Uh, and to ask them the question, what would church need to look like for you? You know, if you were ever going to be a part of it. Um, and cut a long story short, yeah, we managed to do that. We, we, we set up a number of different fresh expressions of church, working with different groups of people in our, in our particular community. Um, lovely mix of people very often. So, you know, I think of one that we, we had a lot of asylum seekers and refugees who, who came to this, this particular community. Um, so we set up a particular fresh expression of church for them, um, but then also had a lot of others in the community who wanted to be involved in supporting the asylum seekers and who weren't Christians themselves, but were just interested that the church was doing this work with asylum seekers. So they came and joined this, uh, this fresh expression of church as well. And it was, you know, it was very relaxed. It was all very low key. Most of it was around food. So it was around cooking together oh, and um, yeah, just sharing food together. Uh, and then, you know, sharing stories of God in the midst of all of that as well. So, so, it, you know, in one sense it's, it's easy to do. It's, um, uh, it, it's not it's not rocket science as they say it's just about going and being with people uh, and then having the confidence to talk with them about God um, but uh, yeah we we, uh, we managed to do that in a number of different places uh, within that, that particular community and and again that stayed with me so even now in my own work now a lot of the work I do now is encouraging that sort of thing within the diocese mm -hmm. and helping people to set up those sorts of fresh expressions of church exciting and um, here's my second to last question therefore and it, and it interrelates i think quite quite well in your in the, the chapter you wrote in that book recently published anglican evangelist you talked about how well this is how it came across to me and i'd love you to sort of it seemed like it was almost like a, a a growing revelation to you that as these opportunities as you portray in your chapter to kind of like go out of the office to go into like pubs to go into local forums start to sort of come about you started to realise that it energised you. And just for the viewer, and perhaps you can go in this yourself, it seems like you seem to thrive on Q&As. You seem to thrive of going into pubs and there'd be like pre, um, at least it seemed to me like, you know, pre-arranged audiences there who were just going to throw any question at you. And for most of it, it's like, that's just like terrifying. But I guess it goes back to, you know, when you were like, you know, doing the work in, in the, uh, the summer schools and stuff and you just learned kind of how to do it then. But nonetheless, 
Mm. I love the sense of how the calling upon us from God can evolve. It's not just one thing as it might be from the beginning, like you're called to be an ex and that's it. You know, there are iterations of that. There are seasons of, of new. And I love that. I love the fact that for you, it was a growing revelation. There you are, you're a bishop. But actually God says, yeah, but I've got something else on top of that or intermixed with that. Could you talk about that growing revelation inside you? But, and it's a two-parter. What, what is the most common question you're asked in pubs? <laughs> and what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Chris. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and that's a, I think that's a, you know, genuinely a very good question, very perceptive of you, yeah, because I kind of referred to that in the book, um, but didn't, didn't sort of elaborate on it too much. But yeah, there, there's been a growing sense. If you'd asked me, I don't know, you know, 10, 15 years ago, did I see myself as an evangelist? I, I, I'm not sure I would have done, really. I, I, I'm, I guess like a lot of people, I had this picture in my head of what an evangelist is, and it didn't look like me, really. So, you know, I'll be honest, I, I'm naturally in, an introvert. You know, I, I, you know I, I need time alone to be able to sort of process things and to re-energize myself and so on. And I've always thought of evangelists, you, know, you have to be extrovert. You've got to be somebody who just loves being out there with, with people and so on. But I guess as, as, as my journey's gone on and different opportunities have come my way, I've started to see that actually, I, I, yeah, I, I kind of am more of an evangelist than I realized. And it, it is things like, as you say, pubs and so on. I, I do this thing now where or I was before lockdown, at least, uh, you know, going to spend a long weekend with a particular church. And I'll say to the vicar of the church, look, um, I, I'd like you just to arrange loads of different activities for me. Um, the key thing is I want to be spending the time with people outside of your church mm -hmm. congregation. Um, so wherever it is in the community, whether it's pubs, whether it's shopping centers, um, old people's homes, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you know, just make sure it's not lots of church services and, and, that, and that sort of thing. Um, so I do this and, and I've, I've just discovered I really love it. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I do, I get energized by it. I always come away at the end of the weekend exhausted, physically exhausted, but spiritually and emotionally just really energized uh, by it. And, um, you know, I realize it's not for everybody. I ab absolutely get that. And, and it's, uh, it's something that I've only gradually sort of grown into over time. But yeah, I do. I, I, I think at one instant, um, you know, one place we, we, the vicar went in and he um, uh, sort of a couple of weeks before I arrived and he said, said to the pub landlord, he said, look, I've got the bishop coming to visit. Um, he said he wants to come and meet people. So, you know, could we come and do something in the pub? And, and the vicar said, look, here's the idea. Um, we'll put out a flyer that says, uh, come and ask the bishop a question and you'll get a free pint. <laughs> so uh, anyway, the landlord agreed with this. The church was going to pay for all these free pints. Wow. Um, and they did. They put a flyer out. Um, so I arrived there anyway on this uh, Saturday evening and the place is absolutely heaving. So, uh, you know, it's not a big, very big pub, but it is crammed such that I can hardly get in the door. Uh, but I get in and... Um, uh, they've set up for this, you know, grill a bishop, as they call it. So where they can just throw any question they want at me. And uh, I have a go at, it, at answering it in some way. Um, cut a long story short, at the end of it all, end of the evening, I end up having a conversation with the landlord who's really interested. He's been listening in on the whole conversation, oh. really interested at all. And uh, at, the, at the end of it all, he says, you know, that, that's been brilliant. One of the best nights we've had in the pub for ages. Uh, I'm going to pay for all the pints, he said. Forget about the church paying for the pints. They're all on me. Uh, um, they, they vary enormously from um, uh, there's usually usually you know, it starts off with lots of banter so there's all the questions about you know football or uh, whatever's going on in the news or whatever celebrity or whatever and what do I think about this and what do I think about that um, there's usually a few questions in there to try and trip me up so, so there's usually one or two people, you know, who will try and ask the sort of trick question either to get me to uh, say something really controversial or, um, uh, or really offensive or, or whatever. Um, but that's, that's all fine. But the really interesting thing for me is how it gradually evolves as time goes on and starts to become more serious questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and before you know it, people are sharing actually some really quite personal stuff mm -hmm. and asking questions. So uh, as I say, it can start off, you know, from, you know, um, uh, you know, what, what do you think about Mohamed Salah, uh, you know, playing for Liverpool through to, um, uh, so uh, my 
uh, X has just been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, why do we, you know, why is there cancer in the world? Why does God allow it? Uh, and, and it's just extraordinary how the conversation kind of, you know, moves on uh, from one thing to another. Um, I, I would say the most common question is suffering. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we get onto the serious part of the conversation, I guess it is most commonly as yes, questions about suffering. Why, why does God allow suffering? Um, why is why is there so much evil in the world? Uh, all that sort of stuff. And, and you know, I, I always, always without fail, I, I will start by answering that question by saying, you know, whatever the question is, by just simply saying, look, I absolutely recognize there's something personal behind your question. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is necessarily, but there's something personal behind it. Um, <clears throat> and I'd love to be able to talk with you more about that if that's appropriate. Um, but then the next thing I would say is, look, I don't have an answer. And if, and if you meet anybody who says to you that they have an answer for why there is suffering in the world, then uh, they're wrong. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think there is an answer to it. Um, but here's what I do know. Uh, and what I do know is that there is suffering in this world, but God hasn't left us to face that on our own. Uh, and God is with us in that suffering. Uh, and God has taken the worst of it on himself through Jesus on the cross. Um, and there is potential for that suffering to be a turn to good in some way. But, you know, it, it, as I say, it's all caveated around by saying, look, there is no perfect answer to that question. And um, I'm always aware that there is something personal behind it. Uh, this is it's never a theoretical question. There is always something, uh, you know, deeply personal. So, uh, yeah, anyway, that, that's the sort of thing I love doing. Uh, I, I just think it's great. And as I said, I love the fact that, because vocation is my vocation as well. Um, so to helping people um, discover more and more who they are in Christ is something that really, really fills my heart. So you talking about how, you know, your ministry has gone, you know, in different seasons, you were this once and then that, and then you, you, you are a bishop. And then even as a bishop, you know, that develops as well. I think that's really inspiring. And it leads me onto the very, very last question. It's a theological question. It's a fun one. Um, and, it's, and it's your take on this, okay? So it's entirely up to, you know, it's your answer. Um, and I said, I ask all the interviewees this, okay? So here we go. Imagine you are in the Easter garden, yeah? You are literally a gardener. Jesus was mistaken as a gardener, but you are a gardener. Maybe you're raking the ground. Um, in my mind, it's a beautiful sort of like spring morning, a um, bit frosty in the morning, that kind of stuff. I don't know if you've ever been to the Middle East, but um, I mean, I could live out there. It's fantastic. Yeah. You are in the Easter garden. So picture yourself there. You are in earshot and eyeshot of the conversation between Mary and Jesus, where, you know, he turns around to her and says, you know, don't touch me. So I've not yet risen to my father. And, and obviously it's, it's, if you like, you know, one of the earliest, if not the earliest uh, witnesses of the resurrection. What happened to humanity mm. on that very first Easter day? Mm. Great question. What happened to humanity? Well, I kind of, I kind of link it, I suppose. So just, you know, immediately off the top of my head, um, you know, you talk about the Easter garden. I link it, I suppose, to the Garden of Eden. And um, there being that sense of, of almost the world beginning over again, Mm -hmm. so, so just as with the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, if you like, starting it all off. And that, however you understand that story of, of uh, the creation of the world and Garden of Eden, I know there's you know, all sorts of arguments about how we understand it and so on. But in whatever way, it's meant to picture for us the beginning of the world. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's kind of the whole story then of how things go wrong in mm -hmm. the world. And it leads up for me to that very moment in another garden uh, where, as you say, Jesus meets with Mary. And it's almost like the new beginning, things starting over again, uh, except this time it isn't Adam and Eve. It's actually God's son, Jesus Christ, who has stood there uh, as a person, but uh, stood there beginning again. So I guess it's that sense of new beginnings for humanity, of humanity starting again. And that means both for every one of us individually, the opportunity to start over again, but also for, for the whole of creation. To, to start over again and there's a there's a sense in which i think all of creation is uh, is, is doing that even at the moment so um yeah so in, in a nutshell i guess a new beginning starting over again that's uh, that's what i think was happening for humanity that was awesome i've done scores of interviews now but no one's ever linked adam and eve to that that's just brilliant that's okay 
<laughs> now, according to my clock, we've got just enough time for the spotlight. Okay. Uh, your secretary bursts in and says, come on, Chris, off you trot. Okay, so it's just a fun game to finish this interview. Before we get into that, can I just thank you? This has been a fantastic interview. It really, really has. And I can't yeah. wait for it to go out. Um, I'll get a draft off to you um, ASAP for you to sort of approve, or not approve, as the okay. case may be, and we'll go from there. But this, as I said, is just a fun way, a light-hearted way uh, to finish the interview. And uh, what I'm after is... Your, you know, your gut reaction, you're very, you know, trying okay. not to think it, that sort of stuff. And there's not many, there's not many. Um, so here we go. Um, the job you'd most like to have if you weren't a bishop? Oh, um, uh, looking after um, a forest in Scotland. Have you ever seen an angel? Ah, uh, I don't think seen an angel but I think had a sense of an angel, um, sense of an angel protecting me and my family, um, mm -hmm. which, uh, yeah, it, you know, I won't go into all the story now, but a pretty scary time when uh, there was a sense in which actually uh, an angel was uh, uh, camped out in front of us looking after us. Oh, yeah. we, I think we need to do a part two at some stage. Because <laughs> right? I want to know what that story is. You've got too many stories for there not to be a part yeah. two. It's interesting, I asked that of all my interviewees, and I would say, more often than not, they say yes in some way. And I think mm. that probably surprises people. Yeah. Coming into land, um, you're in heaven for the first time and you meet Jesus face to face for the first time. What's the first thing that you'd like him to say to you? Oof. Uh, top of my head, um, well done, good and faithful servant. Bishop Snow, uh, Martin Martin Snow, this has been absolutely astonishing. It's been so rich, so full of God, and you have been so generous. You've really shared your heart, and I can't thank you enough for that. Um, and we will honour your God story for sure. Would you mind praying us out? I'd love to do that, Chris. And just a thank you to you as well for doing this. Uh, bless you for your ministry. I think this is a really, really good thing to, uh, to be doing, uh, these sorts of interviews. So, uh, so thank you for that. Let's, uh, yeah, let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you for uh, your overwhelming love for all of creation, for each one of us individually and for all that you've made. And thank you that we have this privilege of sharing our stories with your story and uh, for the amazing way they interweave uh, through the whole of life. So as we thank you for your goodness and your love displayed to us, so I pray for each person uh, watching this whatever their circumstances and whoever they may be. May they experience something of your love and your care for them. And may they be prompted to want to find out more about who you are and about what you've done for us in your son, Jesus Christ. So I pray for your rich blessing upon each one who sees this and ask that they would know your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.